Rudolf Giuliani. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is very difficult to speak after witnessing the atrocities uh, that we just saw. I said some time ago at a gathering similar to this that Camp Liberty wasn't a relocation camp. It was a concentration camp. Many of the people in the State Department and Mr. Kobler were very angry that I said that. When I met with Mr. Kobler personally, he upbraided me for saying that. It's an extermination camp. That's what it's become. It's not just a concentration camp. It's become an extermination camp under the auspices of the United Nations in the United States. How awful is that? How terrible is that? What a breach of faith is that? It's very hard to speak today without great anger. Anger at Maliki, anger at Iran, anger at Kobler, anger at the United Nations, and yes, anger at my own government, my own State Department. That numerous times have promise these people protection just to sit back and not have the courage to even say a word when human beings are being exterminated under the auspices of the United Nations and the United States. What has gone wrong with our decency, with our morality? We're here at a very, very critical time. In uh, one of my favorite operas, Fidelio. Fidelio's husband is imprisoned by a horrible oppressor. His name is Florestan. Fidelio, whose real name is Leonora, does everything that she can to liberate him. She dresses up as a man. She works her way into the prison. She gets herself way down in the prison deep below ground. And because of her courage, her determination, because of her uh, ingenuity, her husband, uh, Florestan, is liberated, ultimately, and the oppressor is driven down. Well, my Leonora is Madame Rajavi. And I say to the people of liberty, and I hate using that word, liberty, for that camp. I say to the people that are living in the concentration camp. I say to the people that are living in what has become the extermination camp. I say to them, you're our Florestans. You're our people that we have the obligation to liberate if we, we want to assuage our consciences at all. This is a very, very critical time. It's a critical time for the people of Ashraf and Liberty and for their safety and survival. That's very concrete. That's very real. We can feel the danger to them, can't we? We can feel that their lives are at great risk. Who knows what Maliki will do? Who knows what the Ayatollahs and the Mullahs will want them to do. So we're here at a time in which the survival of these people who are listening to us, I mean, we're here in Paris and we're safe. We weren't promised protection and we're safe. They were promised protection and they are in legitimate fear of imminent death. So their safety and survival is paramount. But it's beyond that. We also are here at a time in which the safety and the survival and the security of certainly my country and our allies is in grave jeopardy with this agreement that has been reached, this interim agreement that's been reached uh, with the Iranians. 
to have uh, nuclear enrichment uh, curtailed. This is a very, very dangerous agreement. Iran was uh, being crushed by the sanctions, by the isolation. That election in Iran that elected a so-called moderate came about, everyone believes, because of the effectiveness of the sanctions. The sanctions were crippling. The sanctions pushed Iran to do something it hadn't done in five or six or seven or eight years. Iran was desperate for an agreement and ready to make, I believe, substantial concessions. I don't know. You never know if your adversary will make substantial concessions until you demand your adversary to do it. Did we demand them to give up all of their nuclear facilities? Did we demand that even as a first step in discussing things with them, did we demand that they make a list and allow inspections of all of their facilities? Did we demand that the agreement make clear that the six United Nations resolutions that they have violated, that say they are not allowed to enrich uranium, when we had a great opportunity with the leverage that we had to get an agreement that would push back on there being a nuclear power. Please, when the history of this is written, people have to remember that this organization that Madame Rajavi runs, that many of you are part of and have supported, it wasn't just the sanctions that helped bring about this possibility of an agreement that could have been a valid one. It was the work of the MEK. Are we ever going to learn anything from history? Or are we constantly going to just keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again? I have a, um, I have a great hero. He's a great philosopher. His name is Yogi Berra. He was a Yankee baseball player and a catcher. Yogi Berra has an expression called deja vu all over again. I know it's kind of an interesting expression, like all his interesting expressions. This whole thing that we're doing with Rouhani is deja vu all over again. They did this to the, us before. They fooled us like this before. They made jerks out of, out of us like this before. And Rouhani has written it in his book, bragging about it. God, how... How naive can you be? How naive can you be? Gosh, maybe you can be as naive as Chamberlain was when he refused to read or take Hitler's Mein Kampf seriously. Rouhani fooled us once before. They pretended they were going to cease nuclear enrichment. They pretended they were going to stop building any more centrifuges. They pretended they were going to comply with the inspections. And they got caught cheating. Who caught them? Did the UN catch them? Did the US catch them? Did the UK or France catch them? NEK caught them. As the, world, as the world was moving on in this romantic notion that we can negotiate with Iran, everything will be fine, let's sing a few songs and the nuclear weapons will disappear. It was your work that in August of 2002 revealed nuclear sites at Natanz and Iraq. You brought that knowledge to the world. That began to crush this phony act on the part of the Iranian regime. And then in 2005, you revealed a site in central Iran under a mountain, deep under a mountain in Fordo, that would allow Iran to enrich uranium and maybe...
be protected against bombings. It was your work, and I just mentioned two, it was your work that put the lie to what Iran was saying or doing. And Rouhani, in his book, in his memoirs, says that at least they got a couple of good years of fooling us. While we were thinking they weren't doing anything, they were moving straight ahead to becoming a nuclear power. So when you negotiate with someone who has cheated you before, someone who has fooled you before, there are certain things that you have to put into it to protect yourself. The first thing that shouldn't happen, we shouldn't link together, and I fear my government does this, negotiating with the Iranian regime and abandoning our promises to the people of Ashraf and Liberty. These two things are not connected. But I believe in the mind of my government, I believe in the mind of my State Department, these two things are connected. They believe that if they fight too hard to help the people of Liberty and Ashraf, it will undermine these negotiations. First of all, maybe it would be a good thing if we undermine these negotiations. Maybe it would be a good thing if these negotiations started to have some reality built into them. Maybe it would be a good thing if we stood up to Iran and we said, yes, we want you to be nuclear free. Yes, we are willing to make concessions, realistic ones, for nuclear freedom. No nuclear weapons in Iran. But I tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to allow you to slaughter people that we promise to protect just to get some kind of possibly useless agreement. Maybe, maybe if we stood up to them, and maybe if we said, stop slaughtering innocent people in Iraq, stop slaughtering innocent people in Iran, and as you continue to do that, we will not speak to you. And if you continue to do that, you see those sanctions, we'll double them and we'll crush you. Maybe if we spoke to them like that, they would respect us. They would respect the United States of America. You do not, you do not become a supplicant to bullies. The history of the world is replete with examples of what happens to nations, even great ones, that become supplicants to bullies. What you do with bullies is you stand up to them. The people that we're speaking to at camp, concentration camp, Every single one of them has been given a promise by my country of protection in writing. To me, to the Americans who have worked so hard on this, some now for three and four and five years, our heart is broken that our country has in this regard become so dishonorable. I can't imagine why or how this is happening. This isn't a complicated question. These people have been promised protection. Over a hundred of them have been killed. It is quite clear they're being killed by the Iraqis. You would have to be a fool to come to some other conclusion. And unfortunately, we seem to have some fools in our government. You would have to be even a bigger fool You would have to be an even bigger fool not to realize this is being done on the orders of the mullahs and the ayatollahs. So, with that going on, what should we be doing? Should we be just ignoring it because of this agreement, this agreement that appears to be a one-sided agreement helping only Iran? Or would it be a far better strategy 
Would we show more leverage? Would we get more control over Iran if we stood up for these people? If we showed we were a country that was strong enough to stand up ir irrespective of what the consequences are? If an agreement is reached, and I don't know if one will be reached or not, or I should say more, more exactly, I'm not sure one will be re uh, reached that's worth it. But if one is reached, critical to the agreement has to be the ability to inspect. Critical will be inspections. Because the simple fact is, how can we trust them? They have lied to us. They have cheated. They've bragged about it. So inspections will become critical. Inspections have to take place constantly. Inspections have to take place without notice. But there's something else that's more important. Even when we had inspections, if we learned something from history, they were able to fool us while those inspections were going on. If you really want to know what's going on inside Iran, you need a vital MEK in order to do that. And don't you think that right now, part of the effort to continue to pull the wool over our eyes is for Iran and Iraq as their client state to do everything that they can to destroy the power of the MEK so they can operate secretly in Iran. And when an agreement is reached, they will go ahead and enrich uranium and no one, absolutely no one, will be able to get that information to us because the organization that did it before, they are attempting to destroy. It's in our interest to prevent that. If we approached foreign policy and national security with common sense, if we approached it with a sense of how can we secure not just the safety of your people, but the safety of my people. So I conclude with four recommendations. First, and most important, we must uphold our promise. We must keep our promise. There's only one way to keep our promise. The one way to keep our promise is to send American planes to Iraq and take every one of those people who are, I believe, in line for being killed, put them on an airplane, and bring them to the United States of America. And then maybe my country can have its honor back again. <laughs> On the nuclear issue, if there ever is a final agreement, there must be inspections without notice. Third, under no circumstances should we accept the legitimacy of the Iranian regime. How can we? How can we? We overthrew Mubarak. We overthrew Gaddafi. We want to overthrow Assad. You're telling me this regime in Iran is any different than those three? In fact, it's much worse than those three. In fact, it's a much bigger enemy of my country than those three. In fact, it's killed many more Americans than those three combined. What kind of foreign policy can we have? What kind of respect in the world can we have? What kind of consistency can we have in the message we're giving the world if we believe that everything has to be done to overthrow Mubarak, Gaddafi, and Assad, but keep the Ayatollah in power? We cannot accept regime change. We cannot accept the legitimacy of a regime who in the last hundred days, or let's say the first hundred days of the reformers regime, has killed over 400 people. They're still murderers. They're still killers. They're not just attempting to kill the people of Camp Liberty. They're killing their own people. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten a day under the reformer. Wake up! And finally, America should recognize that there is a democratic alternative to the regime in Iran. It exists. It's real. It has enormous support. It's gained credibility by the blood of its martyrs. And that alternative is the MEK. 
Recognizing that will put tremendous pressure. Recognizing that, recognizing that will put tremendous pressure on the Iranian regime. And more important than the Iranian regime, it will give hope to the people of Iran who desperately need hope. All of us, all of us are seriously concerned. All of us are there to help. But the people most affected are the people at liberty. And I say to them directly, you're not alone. You're not forgotten. And your sacrifices will be the building blocks on which your great peoples and your once great nation will get reestablished. And you will be the heroes of the future. Under Madame Rajavi's leadership, I know that everything will be done to deliver you and that the freedom you achieve for your people is going to happen. It's a long road. It's a dangerous road. It's a road that others have traveled. But when the idea of freedom is alive, when it has this kind of support, when it has a determined leader like Madame Rajavi, and when it has people who are willing to die for it, freedom prevails and it will for Iran. Thank you and God bless you.